Let's bring my regular Thursday night guest, the Australian's foreign editor, Greg Sheridan. We'll start, if we can, Greg, with that speech today from Jacinda Ardern. And on so many levels, it was a shocker. She was lecturing Australia on not taking sides in the Pacific. It would also be wrong to position the Pacific in such a way that they have to pick sides. But of course, the rest of the world is taking sides on China's regional aggression. Then there was this rebuke on what she calls the violence of climate change. Her words, not mine. Climate change must be a foreign policy priority. While we all have a concern, and rightly so, about any moves towards militarisation of our region that must surely be matched by a concern for those who experience the violence of climate change. And she finished off giving us a spray on Indigenous issues. I played a little bit of that uh, a bit earlier. When, as my guest last night, Oliver Hardwich explained, her handling of Māori issues at home has sent her approval ratings plummeting with the opposition leader now in front of Ardern. Am I being uh, too tough on St Jacinda, Greg? No, uh, Peter, <clears throat> it's great to be with you. You're being your normal Christian charitable self. I have to tell you, honestly, I think Jacinda Ardern as a political leader is as silly as a two-bob watch. I don't know any leader anywhere in the world who talks so much nonsense so consistently and gets such lavish, wonderful praise for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what she's taking in her morning coffee. She says, don't position the Pacific in, into a state where it's got to pick sides. We're trying to give the Pacific an alternative from being conscripted into debt traps and uh, hegemony by the most ruthless authoritarian dictatorship in the world. And she says, don't, don't cast this struggle as one between authoritarianism and democracy. She might as well say, don't describe the sky as blue and the, and, and, and the, you know, and the trees as green. Uh, I, I honestly, That's from one day to the other, I just through, have no it, idea though? what she's on about. Sorry, say That's again. That's her socialist history. That's her socialist history coming through, you know, uh, her time as the international president when she was a young woman. And, of course, remember, at the start of the COVID crisis, when Australia was saying there's got to be a Fed income review and in how COVID got out uh, into the global environment, she was saying don't target China. Yeah, I mean, New Zealand has been a strategic nullity for a long time, ever since they bugged out of ANZUS in the mid-1980s. They have no defence forces to speak of. They make no strategic contribution. Uh, they're almost entirely useless in strategic issues. They have adopted as their national code the bludgers uh, option. They just rely on Australia mm. to take care mm. of their security. They are to us, but a million times worse, what we are to the United States. And um, she comes from the worst woke, unreal, fantasy-dwelling strain in New Zealand politics. It was a very eccentric electoral system that saw her become Prime Minister. She won about 8% less than the Nationals uh, under their very eccentric uh, voting system. And the economy has gone backwards under her. The society has gone backwards. Mm -hmm. They're not even performing in reducing their greenhouse emissions. Not that it would have any no. effect if they did. I, I mean, I, I just don't... I think she makes no sense about anything, really. I agree with that. I'll leave it here. But what worries me is the number of people in this country who hold them up as a model to adopt, particularly on things like uh, Indigenous issues. Indigenous issues, but I'll come to that in a moment. Hey, uh, really and truly, this submarine saga, new Defence Minister Richard Miles, Adelaide yesterday, standing alongside the new Premier, saying that we're going to build these submarines, we're going to build them as quickly as possible, all tick and tick, and we're going to build them in Adelaide. Are we crazy? I mean, we're going to end up with these boondoggles. You know and I know that the, the defence boffins in Canberra will make entirely way too complex. They'll cost way more than we're told they're ever going to cost. And, of course, we'll, we, we'll wait years and years and years before they ever hit the water. Well, you're absolutely right, Peter. The idea that we can build nuclear submarines in Adelaide when we, by the time we start, we won't have even built a conventional submarine for 30 years. Or, or, or more years, so we have no expertise at all. Um, the government has got to start being more honest with us. Now, I'm very critical of the previous government as well. So Peter Dutton told us in opposition that he was only joking when he said we were going to build them in Adelaide. We're actually going to get the first couple 
uh, from the United States and um, and mm. and then only build down the track in Adelaide, maybe, perhaps, maybe not. Uh, now, Miles has been honest enough to say, well, of course, when I say build in Adelaide, I don't really mean build in Adelaide because obviously we can't build the nuclear reactor or anything like that. But just by trying to build the thing in Adelaide, uh, we'll delay it by many years and add many tens of billions of dollars. I'm a bit, un, you know, unhinged. Uh, no, a bit. I'm made a bit uneasy by the defence minister talking about we'll know by next March when we'll get it. No, we won't. We might know by then what defence forecasts, but defence forecasts on any major equipment purchase, much less major equipment construction, has never been right within mm. a factor of years and years and years. Now, everybody knows it's going to take years longer if you try to build it in Adelaide and cost tens of billions of dollars more. But Richard Miles was saying this was the cheapest and quickest way to get it today. Now, frankly, nobody... I mean, you'd have to be a cryptographer of very high skill to interpret what on earth Australian governments are talking about with this nuclear sub. It's one reason, Peter, that I've become an advocate of, an, of another conventional sub in the meantime, because in the end, something beats nothing. And I'm very worried if we stay on this path, yeah, we'll end up as we did in World War II with nothing at all. Hang on, unpack this for me. If Richard Miles is, is running the same defence policy on submarines as the former government, if they are, as they say, not a cigarette paper different to them, why do we have to wait till March to know whether we can do it? Because Peter Dutton, just before the election, and if he'd been re-elected, would be saying right now we can do it. Why does defence need now another six to eight months to model what they would have been modelling for the coalition only months ago? Why the delay? So I have great respect and admiration for Peter Dutton as a politician, as a political leader, and I think he's a very good human being. But I don't think anything he says about submarines is worth two bob. He didn't tell us about this fabulous new plan to get two submarines out of the American line without American Congress approving of it or anything like that until after he'd lost the election. He didn't tell us that he wasn't going to build all the submarines in Adelaide until after he lost the election. So, I, I frankly, I don't think anyone from the Morrison government has one cracker worth of credibility. Now, one of the problems is mm. that we've delayed everything for so long that you end up with a rush... When you delay a decision for 15 years, you end up with a rush decision at the end. Uh, we've got to know by March what we're doing. But at the same time, simultaneously to that, we've got to uh, undertake um, other studies about whether we can do a conventional sub. You see, it's, it's also... It's not just us knowing what we can do. It's the Americans agreeing that we will have the capability to run nuclear subs. Now, they're not going to let us have their technology if they think we're going to have an accident or make a mess of it or, or blow it up or something. So by March, we not only have mm. to know what we want to do, we've got to convince the Americans that we are credible in doing it. Now, frankly, if I was the Americans, I, I, you know, I wouldn't lend us a bloody toy, a toy aeroplane. You know, uh, this just... This whole thing is such a spectacular uh, look, it just goes mess. from bad to Defense. worse. It's so frustrating. It is so frustrating. Um, let's move on to some other it issues. Really is. I want to talk to Defense you about... Defence has such uh, a... The new... Sure. You can finish, Greg. It's all right. Good. I've got a bit oh, of a delay. Oh, sorry, sorry, Peter. I didn't... No, I was just going to say, Defence has such a, such a culture of secrecy and governments don't bust that open enough. And, and nor does the media, but all credit to you. This news today that Labor are now eyeing off dates between May and November 2023 to have this uh, pretty contentious Indigenous voice to the Parliament go to the people in a referendum. Now, at the same time today, in, in your newspaper, The Australian, the Tasmanian Indigenous leader, Michael Mansell, was saying that he, he thinks this is a second-grade option, a completely counterproductive, he says. He's actually going to campaign against the voice, uh, and instead of the voice, he wants six Senate seats reserved entirely for Aboriginal people. Now, this is extraordinary. We've got Warren Mundine and Jacinta Price who also oppose the voice, although for very different reasons. Uh, this voice is dividing more people than it's uniting. So I think the government's uh, brave in Sir Humphrey terms to put a referendum up if they're not sure of success. Yeah, so Michael Mansell's position is completely ridiculous. The idea that you'd have six 
senators elected on a tiny franchise and you'd have to work out the government would have to determine the racial status of everybody who wanted to vote for those six senators. Uh, so we would have the whole project of liberalism for the last 200 years has been to get race out of civic life and this would put race back into civic life and those six senators would get to vote on all issues, defence, budget and so on. So that'll never fly. But it does show you that uh, any specific model they put up will have lots of specific alternatives. Now they're saying they don't want to put up a specific model, they just have a general proposition in the Constitution that the government can, uh, can must create a voice. But of course, once you have vague words in the Constitution, the High Court can do mm. anything to it. Now, a lot of people of goodwill think, you know, it's very mean for people like me to oppose this, but I oppose it on liberal progressive grounds that there should be no... Uh, distinctions of race in our constitution. And then they go further and say, and if you oppose it, it might lose, and what a terrible tragedy that would be. I think it would be, frankly, a good thing if it was voted at referendum and it was lost. That would not be a vote against Aborigines, whom we all love. It would be a vote against mm. distorting the constitution. And the fact that the conservative side of Australian life won't look the Aboriginal leadership in the eye and say, no, we're opposed to this in principle, that's another thing I think Peter Dutton should mm. do. Um, that, oh, I that couldn't agree with you more there. This is a matter this of miasma principle. that we have.